we're public now. Okay, so members, you're very welcome to today's um, Executive Office Committee meeting. Um, this is our first meeting that is being held uh, completely virtually, so everybody is using the Starleaf facility today. Uh, which is, I suppose, a reflection of where we are uh, with COVID, that we don't really need to be traveling unless we absolutely have to. And because we've got this capacity to do our committee meetings, um, we will utilize this. Uh, the, the meeting is, of course, been recorded and as well been broadcast uh, through uh, Parliament Buildings and through the online facility as well. Can I ask all members, this makes life a lot easier if you're not actually speaking to make sure that your microphone is on mute uh, and also to use the raise hand function if you wish to be, um, be able to get my attention. I have a list of all those that are participating in the meeting down the side and if you use the raise hand function I'll be able to see that you're looking to come in and contribute uh, in whichever part of the meeting that we're at. Um, also, just given that it is our first meeting today, if members could just bear with us in case there are any technical issues or any glitches, uh, just in case that we need to, to move people in and out of the meeting, just as would if we were having the committee in the room, uh, we would take a little break to let people come in and out. So there may be some instances of that today, just waiting for people to get on board to the spotlight part of the meeting. Um, I just double check with the clerk in terms of apologies, but I don't think there's any apologies received, is there, Michael? No. Okay. No, no, no. No, none received there. Uh, moving in to um, Drop Chairman's uh, business, um, I do just want to acknowledge the statement that was made to the House of the uh, Minister, Deputy Minister, about mother and baby scandal. Now, as was mentioned right across the House yesterday, this was a disgraceful part of our history, and it is only uh, proper that we are now putting it right, albeit that it is many, many years late. So we will look forward to assessing the research, and we thank Judith Gillespie uh, and her interdepartmental working group, and hope that we can see the quick establishment of the subgroup of survivors who will form part of that co-design process uh, and that the six months will pass quickly, if not sooner, uh, to be able to get their determinations and a shape uh, on matters for survivors going forward. Um, also, I want to just make reference to last week to the um, statement in the House from the Finance Minister, which highlighted the fact that the Secretary of State was refusing to meet with the Executive over the issue of funding for victims' pension. And this is another issue where victims and survivors here in Northern Ireland are being left behind. And it does feel at times like they're being tra uh, treated and traded like they're a commodity, and that's unacceptable. Uh, and I would ask and suggest maybe with the committee's indulgence that we write to the Secretary of State and urge him to um, immediately meet with the uh, executive to resolve this issue. Uh, he may not want to be part of the resolution, uh, but we here on this committee are the ones that um, deal with the ramifications and see the human face uh, of the delay in the decisions that are taken. So would members be happy if we send that uh, letter to the Secretary of State? Okay. Um, also then, I just want to acknowledge that today is also World Holocaust Day. Uh, I think that it's right and proper that we remember and learn from our, the history there and ensure that the stories of uh, those that were impacted uh, continue to be heard and, and aren't forgotten. Um, there are important lessons from the Holocaust about tolerance and respect and we should and they, they should speak to us today uh, and I think that it's important that such relevant matters are included. So it's just a highlight. And I think that people are being asked at 8 o'clock tonight to put a candle in their window uh, in commemoration of World Holocaust Day, if that suits. Maybe if I could just remind members again that you make sure that you're muted if you're not speaking. So just to make sure that the mute is uh, included there, uh, for otherwise we get the feedback coming through the system. Item three is draft minutes. Uh, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of January are page six of the meeting pack. Are members content that they are a true reflection of the proceedings? Great. Okay. 
I like this if so and I'll indicate that I'll sign the minutes. I think that means I'll probably do that somewhere next week or dribble on the wall of my house here or somewhere. But yeah, uh, we'll do that at a point when required. And in terms of matters arising, um, the departmental briefing officials informed the committee that the Brexit subcommittee had been replaced by the committee overseeing EU exit matters. Uh, on page 13 of the meeting pack, there is the uh, terms of reference for the new executive office committee dealing with the EU exit matters. And on page 21, uh, the terms of reference for the original uh, exit subcommittee. So our members are happy enough to note those. Okay. Um, and also, yes, Martina. Oh. Sorry, Chair, I had raised my hand. Chair, just to suggest to you that even though that information may be available in the committee or in the life, I came out of the meeting this morning, the infrastructure committee, I know the members aren't aware of that information you've just imparted. So I think it would be good practice to share that with the committee's members. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. If others aren't aware, then it's important that we share that information. So we'll share it with the other committees then. Okay. Um, then on uh, the refer members to page three of the table back is communication that's there from Chris Stewart. And it relates to the question that the deputy chair had raised about amendments to the ministerial code. Uh, pursuant to the Executive Committee Functions Act during every session by officials. So are you content enough to note that, Doug? Yeah, can I, thank, you. thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, members, um, that is the matters arising, which means that we can move on then to item five, which is the Brexit, the oral evidence session with the junior ministers on Brexit issues. I definitely see that we've got... Minister Lyons in the audience section will get him moved up. Um, I'm not sure, maybe he'll let us know or if Minister Kearney is joining us as well. And just prior to that, whilst I absolutely expect Martina, you to have your hand up for the next section, the wee bit is the need to lower it to bring it back up again. But I said, do you want to leave it there? I know that you'll <laughs> become a on the Brexit issues, but I forgot to say that the members that once you raise it, you need to click it again to lower it uh, and then back up again. But hopefully we'll, uh, the communications team will get Gordon Lyons up in the spotlight for us. Thank you very much, Mr. Lyons. And, uh, are you on your own or... I'm 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 I'm, 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 I'm where I am right now. Um, it was my expectation that the minister would be uh, joining us. Um, I'm not sure if there may be technical difficulties. I know this is the first time that I've used Starlight. Starlight. Uh, so uh, maybe the same. For, obviously, I'm doing this the first time I've used this. So um, I'm not sure what his current status is. Be happy to make opening uh, remarks and see if he. In the meantime, Mr. Chairman, but to uh, to okay. step. Okay. You, you happy enough to do the opening remarks then, on, on, and then hopefully we can see if maybe find out. I'm trying to work out who's the best, um, who's going to be the best taxi contact. Declan, maybe Martina, would you have a contact or Gordon, maybe just to see if I uh, just send a wee message here to now to the uh, private office, Mr. Chairman. And I, okay. I've sent a message direct to Declan and, and to one of his commanders uh, to find out what's happening. Okay. We are being advised, if we can, to use headphones because I think there, there's feedback, but I'll maybe see because my microphone is on most. If it's maybe coming from mine, um, we can wait for maybe three seconds and see where Mr. Kearney is. I try to remember. Are these?
Dolphin, maybe. Yeah. Do you, do you maybe want to make a start then, Gordon, and, and hopefully... Yes, I'm more than happy to uh, uh, do that, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. and kind of thank everybody again for the for the invitation. It's good to be able to be with you with you here uh, today, and in particular, can I echo the comments that you have made, uh, Mr. Chairman, in relation to Holocaust uh, Memorial Day? Um, it was one of the first public engagements that uh, myself and Declan Kearney were involved in um, last year. After we were appointed this um, a position was to go to the event at Belfast City Hall. It was very poignant, and it is important that we um, remember what took place, um, that we that we never uh, forget the horrors uh, of that time, and that we continue to learn lessons uh, from that. Um, Mr. Chairman, can I just confirm that you can hear me? Um, okay, the sound and everything's okay. Lovely. Well, look, I, like I've said, I do welcome the opportunity to provide you with an update on EU exit uh, matters. Since the last time that we briefed the committee, the transition period has come to an end and we have moved on to an operational and implementation focus. In December, work in relation to EU exit intensified with key decisions and agreement on both the operation of the protocol and on the future relationship with the EU concluding. The lateness of both agreements, however, has meant that there has been little time for businesses and citizens mm -hmm. to prepare, and this has been a significant challenge, particularly in terms of our work on operational readiness, which um, hopefully um, Minister Kearney will touch on um, when... So we appear to have lost Gordon there, uh, probably in the in the good the good realms of the excellent broadband facilities that there are between uh, Stormont Parliament buildings and Stormont Castle, etc. But maybe I see he's back in again in the audience. So hopefully we can get him moved back up into the spotlight again. Okay, there we go. That's him. in the spotlight but I just don't see him and he's gone again uh, my earphones aren't working right he's back to, there we go hi there sorry it's the connection of failed apologies that's uh, okay I'm not sure how much you you got of that but obviously I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the uh uh, the, the, the TCA. And um, in reality, Mr. Chairman, the text of the TCA is complex and policy officials and legal advisors across departments are continuing to scrutinise the detail of that, engaging closely with their counterparts in Scotland and Wales and uh, also with UK government officials as well. For the executive, this is a particularly complex exercise given the interactions between the trade and cooperation agreement and the protocol which requires specific uh, assessment. It is early days in this process, but we will make sure that the committee is kept updated on this important area. area. Gordon, can I just pause you there? We have mm -hmm. Declan in the, uh, the audience. If we could um, bump him up into the spotlight there and give him a second to come on board, and then that way... Sure. Uh, sure. I think he might be on us by telephone just rather than video looking by that. So can you hear us at this stage, Declan? I can, Colin. And apologies about uh, my technical difficulties. My, my keyboard seems to be playing up. Okay, no problem. That's great. And so Sorry, we, uh, we'll go back to yourself then, Gordon, and then you can present as you have planned. Okay. So in taking that work forward, our, our key objective remains the same, securing the best possible outcome for our people and businesses. Uh, ensuring um, that we're on a firm foundation, not only now, um, but in the following months and years will be key uh, to that. Now, in the lead up 
to the end of the transition period, there was significant engagement at ministerial and official level. As the committee will be aware, that work and engagement continues. And in that regard, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight some other key meetings and decisions that have taken place over the past few weeks and to provide you with a high level future look at what we are expecting in coming weeks. So two meetings of the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations, um, the JMCEM, took place in December, allowing us to keep up updated on progress in the negotiations and to make sure our concerns were highlighted. In all our engagement on the negotiations, we stress that every effort should be made to reach a future relationship agreement with the EU, which takes account of the interdependencies and interactions with the protocol and reflects the social, economic and environmental interests of our citizens and businesses. In addition, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister represented the Executive at the Joint Committee meeting on the 17th of December 2020, when decisions on at-risk goods, agriculture and fisheries subsidies and EU supervision were formally approved. In addition, two unilateral declarations were made at the Joint Committee. The UK submitted a unilateral declaration on export declarations to simplify processes for businesses moving goods from NI to GB, and the EU submitted a unilateral declaration to allow a grace period of six months on the import of chilled meat products, a grace period of three months on official certification, and a grace period of one year on human and veterinary medicines. These measures have proven important in supporting the operability of the protocol from the 1st of January. However, they have been provided uh, to allow businesses to adapt and prepare uh, for the new requirements. And it's essential um, that we, and particularly our, our traders, uh, take full advantage uh, of that as we prepare for the end of those grace periods. Now, turning to other aspects of EU exit, I understand the committee received a briefing on the progress of common frameworks programs on the 13th of January. Additionally, the UK Internal Market Act came into operation on the 31st of December, and work is ongoing across departments to clarify its provisions and understand its application, and in particular, its interaction with the common frameworks program. And finally, before I hand over to Minister Kearney, we understand that you've received a series of briefings from officials, um, the Human Rights Commission and the Quality Commission in respect of preparations for exit from EU. As you know, the Equality Commission is sponsored by the Executive Office, and I understand that the Commission has recruited and put in place a team to deal with the dedicated Funding has been secured for that until March 2023, and the Northern Ireland Office has made clear that the commitment set out in Article 2 of the protocol uh, is enduring. We therefore fully expect the dedicated me mechanism to exist beyond 22-23, uh, and future funding levels will be discussed with HMT uh, at the appropriate time. And Mr Chairman, I hope that this has been uh, helpful. However, I will pass over to uh, Minister Kearney for further updates. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. And uh, once again, Colin, can I apologise uh, for my inability to appear on screen? It's a very unsatisfactory arrangement, but I've spent about 35 minutes trying to work with a, a keyboard that seems to be faulty, so I apologise. I'll proceed, Colin, now um, with uh, my presentation. So thanks uh, to you and uh, the committee for the opportunity to provide this update. Uh, I'll cover our operational readiness coming up to the end of the transition period and provide some detail on ongoing work to address the current operational issues. At a ministerial level, the executive have continued to take part in the Westminster government's EXO or Exit Operations Committee meetings. And these have been taking place on an almost daily basis uh, since the end of the transition period. They provide an opportunity for the executive to highlight the need to address ongoing operational issues as soon as possible. Of course, in advance of the end of the transition period, significant work was taken forward across departments with a specific focus on day one readiness. An important part of that preparation included fulfilling the executive's obligations under the protocol in relation to SPS checks 
and engaging with local businesses to help mitigate high-impact issues and risks. While significant progress was made in terms of operational readiness and business preparedness following the end of the transition period, there remain some operational issues which have the potential to impact significantly on our economy and on our people. And in light of this, work is progressing across departments to resolve immediate issues, whilst also preparing for the end of the grace periods. Because of the nature of the issues, this also involves close engagement with Westminster, Irish government officials and businesses. Since the 1st of January, trade bodies and individual businesses have highlighted initial challenges and difficulties in adjusting to the new requirements. This is particularly so in relation to the movement of goods following the end of the transition period, with reported disruption and short-term reductions in the availability of some product lines and shops, particularly in relation to fresh produce. However, this is not unique to ourselves as similar challenges are being reported in Britain. Whilst the movement of goods through ports here has been relatively smooth, particular challenges have been identified by hauliers and traders in relation to the movement of goods into the north from Britain via Dublin port. The underlying issue, both in relation to Dublin port and the wider movement of goods between Britain and here, remains the lack of preparedness of British companies for the additional paperwork and processes required as a result of the protocol, as well as the impact of EU exit on groupage issues. To address the lack of preparedness of British-based companies, our officials have been engaging closely with colleagues in London and Dublin. In response, additional guidance and support has been developed by the Trader Support Service for transit from Britain, with further guidance and support currently being developed for transit to Britain through Dublin. The TSS are also increasing reach out, including seminars to increase awareness and compliance of businesses across the water. Similarly, to assist in the movement of goods through Dublin Port, the Irish government has implemented a temporary arrangement for notification of goods. Whilst this will hopefully help in the short term, the easement is provided on condition that traders work with Irish revenue to upskill and ensure future compliance. As I mentioned, groupage has also been a challenging area. Prior to the 1st of January, many goods, particularly agri-food, were transported as part of mixed loads, often referred to as groupage. Groupage worked well in the context of the EU single market and helped to drive efficiencies for our hauliers who operate to tight margins and turnaround times. Exit from the EU has introduced significant constraints to this, and that presents a major challenge for all our hauliers but it in particular affects those smaller companies who are not benefiting from the grace period stipulated for supermarkets. Officials have been engaging with Westminster and businesses to identify and trial a number of options. We're expecting guidance on groupage to be published once the outcome of those trials are known. In regards to the grace periods that uh, Gordon has mentioned, a three-month grace period is in place for supermarkets meaning that they do not have to provide export health certificates on products of animal origin until the 1st of April 2021. This has worked well, but given the volumes of produce being handled by supermarkets, it is vital that we ensure that they are ready for the end of the grace period. As you know, there is also a six-month grace period for prohibited and restricted goods, such as chilled meat products. Whilst that would seem a relatively long time, We plan on taking a proactive approach to this, as it is important that the supply of these products is maintained. The expiry of the grace periods will likely lead to increased challenges if we don't resolve the current issues now. Equally, it is important that businesses are encouraged and supported to move to compliance. Concerns remain about the ability and capacity in Britain to issue export health certificates as the system will have to be fully operational before the end of the current grace period. And we've raised this issue at the XO meetings, which I mentioned, and have been seeking assurances that there is sufficient veterinary capacity to meet the certification needs of the supermarkets that supply us. When we last briefed uh, the committee, 
the issue of VAT on used cars was in the news. We pressed the British government on several occasions for a resolution of the issue in relation to the VAT margin for second-hand cars, and we welcome the guidance that they issued on the 14th of January, which seems to have resolved this matter. There do remain a number of important matters to be resolved, including export health certificates for live animals and the import of seed potatoes, which could adversely affect our economy if solutions are not found. We continue to press Westminster for resolution and the introduction of workable solutions. Having said that, progress is being made in putting in place interim and longer term solutions in a number of important areas, such as new guidance in relation to parcels, including a three month grace period, has clarified the position, and we expect Westminster to publish further guidance soon. We'll be happy to take any questions or observations that you may have, Colin, and I hope that that presentation came across clearly for all members. Thank you, uh, Minister Kearney and Minister Lyons, for that uh, presentation. Um, just a slight moment there, but we had thought we had lost Minister Lyons, but he's back up into the uh, spotlight with us again. Um, so, look, we'll, we'll move to questioning and see if we can work with this, and hopefully it will work uh, through this process as it would if we were all in the room. Um, so maybe as well, if I might apologise if some of these questions have been touched on already in the presentation, because some of it was in, in and out as well. But there has been uh, much discussion uh, about the problems with the flow of goods back and forth between GB and NI. And I think, I suppose, it is at times getting a little tiresome to hear that it's the protocol's fault. Uh, and would you accept that there were no problems with the flow of goods before Brexit? Uh, and that there was uh, no problem with the flow of goods before the end of the transition period, and that the problems that are here are caused by Brexit uh, and not the protocol. It seems a, a bit naive. It's like blaming the bull in the china shop for all the breakages without thinking about how it got in there in the place. Well, look, if, if, I, could, if I could take that first, um, Mr. Sherman, you'll not be surprised uh, to hear that I take a, a different view from you on that. Um, the, the problems that we're experiencing now, the, of course, they're a result uh, of the protocol. Uh, we're not having those issues between um, England and Wales. We're not having those issues uh, between England and Scotland. The reason why we're having problems right now between Great Britain and Northern Ireland is as a result uh, of the protocol, the additional burdens that have been put in place, the different requirements that are there in terms of declarations and in terms of checks that need to take place. This is something that we have long warned about. Um, we said that there were implications uh, for putting um, a regulatory border down the Irish Sea in this way. So this shouldn't come as a, a shock or a surprise to anyone. Uh, this is something that we had certainly warned about uh, in the past. And the protocol is not a good outcome for Northern Ireland in, in no way, shape uh, or form. And I've had many meetings um, both within the executive, um, as an executive office minister and as a constituency um, representative. And there are a number of problems and a number of concerns that are there. And that's a, as a result of the protocol, not because of the decision of the UK to leave the uh, European Union. Now, from my point of view, I want to make sure that I do everything that I can in the first instance uh, to make sure that we mitigate against the worst uh, impacts of it. Um, that's why we, as Declan has said, we've been in frequent, um, in fact, daily conversations with the government through the EXO meetings. And it's within those meetings that we raise the issues on all sorts of issues, such as groupage and export health certificates and seed potatoes and pet passports, parcels, secondhand cars, steel. That's what we've been spending uh, our month doing, is making sure that we um, find a, a way around uh, all of this. Because those um, issues aren't happening uh, within the rest of the UK, it's between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, and it's a, as a direct result of the protocol. I'm happy to come in if you wish, Colin. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the first thing yeah. I would say, uh, the, the first thing I would say, uh, Colin, is that uh, Gordon and I specifically have uh, been investing a considerable amount of time since the beginning of the year and highlighting these issues and trying to find workable solutions and uh, 
uh, resolutions to to the problems that have been occurring, and we've stayed very closely in contact with our business sector, uh, taking on board uh, their information and their suggestions about what needed to be done, and then making the appropriate representations. But the the fact of the matter is that the protocol exists because of Brexit. Uh, so, in that sense. Uh, I would point you to the fact that uh, opportunities were offered by the European Commission to the British government for transition, uh, for extensions to the transition period, to ensure that uh, all of the necessary issues were anticipated and resolved well in advance of the close of the transition period. And as you will recall, uh, the British government chose not to seek uh, leave for an extension to the transition period. So when we talk about the difficulties that we've witnessed uh, over the course of the last uh, few weeks, then I think uh, it bears reminding ourselves that uh, we, we, we did not get the benefit of a potential extension to the transition when, when it was in fact available to us. The second thing I would say is that we now have uh, built into the uh, arrangements two grace periods, one which is going to come up at the end of March, beginning of April, and the other at the end of June, beginning of July. And uh, those are watermarks. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, the period of grace that has been provided, uh, in fact, resolves the challenges that apply within those periods. Other ways, potentially, we find ourselves having other very significant difficulties at the end of those grace periods. And therefore, I, I do think that uh, the British government needs to be paying very close attention to the issues we've been highlighting, but also uh, to the potential uh, negative repercussions uh, percussions that could arise at the end of those two grace periods if all of the relevant issues have not, in fact, been uh, addressed. Michel Barnier was interviewed. Uh, last uh, week, and he said in a very clear interview, uh, Brexit means Brexit, and and these are the new trading realities that we all have to live with. And I think that what we're seeing at the moment are the consequences of new trading realities, with uh, the North having been taken out of uh, the European Union as a result of the uh, EU Brexit decision. Okay. Uh, and I welcome the constructive approach that both of you are taking and trying to address the key concerns that there are uh, with with the protocol to be able to get workable solutions and um, i do think though that it would be helpful if you sent that memo around your uh, party colleagues and minister kearney you don't need to send that memo so um moving on to the um the, the support for for the um, and in terms of uh, finding out about the support that you have been providing here, the concrete support you've been providing for businesses here, and also maybe if we could get an update on the interaction with the um, with the British government in terms of the support they're providing for businesses there that are having difficulties. And I suppose in looking at those difficulties, as you have referenced, there's a six-month grace period for the simplified procedures six months for chill goods and one year for the pharmaceutical product. So what has been on today? What's been right now to prepare for those, the three months, the six months and the 12 months um, cliff edges that we're going to move towards so that we don't have problems at that stage? Would you like to go first, Gordon, or shall I? You can go ahead, Dec, and I'll come in afterwards. Sure. So there's been a, a very intensive engagement with our, our own uh, business community uh, in relation to uh, bottoming out uh, operational issues that, uh, that have arisen. Uh, for example, uh, back on uh, the, thir the 13th of, of January, uh, we attended a meeting with uh, a cross-section of our business organisations, including the Holliers and, uh, and a number of the other uh, key producers uh, and those who have significant responsibilities to ensure that uh, goods produced here, manufactured here, are successfully uh, um, uh, ex exported from the north into Britain and uh, and beyond. I found that to be a very constructive meeting. 
uh, in terms of uh, a number of the key pinch points that were uh, that, that were being highlighted at that particular time. Groupage uh, was very clearly spelt out. Uh, as a direct result, we took away those groupage issues. And I think we've made some significant progress in relation to trying to have those issues ironed out. Colin, I did indicate that we're, we're hoping for some announcement on that. Uh, there, there's trialling being carried out, but a fair bit of work has been done uh, between the respective departments in trying to find workable solutions between DEFRA in Britain and DERA here in the north. Other issues that came up that, that I, I found uh, fairly significant were the concerns uh, expressed by some on that particular call in relation to the, uh, the support health attestations that are required uh, to be signed off on. And that's a cost uh, that arises and can arise for local businesses here. Uh, so we took that particular point away uh, back into those EXO meetings and we actually asked that work be carried out on that particular issue which would have a, a, a repercussive cost on businesses here to have it absorbed within what's known as the Movement Assistance Scheme which, uh, which applies and has actually been absorbing costs uh, incurred uh, costs arising for goods flowing from Britain into the north that arguably if that was not addressed could pass on costs to consumers. Uh, we do have an, an interdepartmental working group uh, on EU exit. Uh, it's, it's now been subsumed by what's described as a senior users group, uh, which is working in a very practical way, day by day, to ensure that uh, these issues are find, being found uh, with work, working solutions, sustainable working solutions, and where not that the necessary uh, issues are being communicated back to colleagues in Britain and also in, uh, in Dublin. I think that uh, the, the degree to which local businesses have been supported um, is as a result of the, the investment of time that the executive and officials spent in uh, fairly close contact, listening carefully to uh, the issues that they anticipated. The real dilemma uh, that we have seen has been the fact that the British government has not invested the same type of energy or focus in preparing uh, British-based businesses which would uh, export to the north uh, in, in respect of ensuring that they understand the new uh, regulations that apply. And, uh, and that's the contradiction, I think, that has come to the fore. Significant preparation on this side on very specific practical operational issues uh, which continues, and uh, a failure from the outset to ensure that uh, British-based businesses were adequately prepared in the same way. Okay. Gordon? So, um, two, two issues really just to highlight. Um, the first is, uh, in terms of support, um, I think De I think Declan's right insofar as the um, businesses in BB were not as well prepared. And I think a lot of that comes down to the to the Trader Support Service. Many, many businesses in Northern Ireland were signed up and were aware of the new um, burdens that have been placed upon them. Um, as a result of the protocol, that was not always the case for businesses in GB. That is an issue that we highlighted at the very start of this month on our daily EXO calls. And it is something that the government has, first of all, recognised and now committed to do more to help business preparedness in the rest of GB. And I think that's the uh, a really important step that's been um, taken to, to help with some of the problems that have come as a result of this. The second major concern that we have um, is the end of the uh, grace period, and that really is the biggest concern um, that we have uh, right now, and, and um, it's absolutely the case. We have met with a, a number of people from key sectors over recent weeks, and um, there's a huge amount of concern about their ability um, to deal with the new processes that are going to be uh, in place. Uh, hospitality is in um, is in a place right now where it is obviously trading um, very little. When that comes to the end of the grace period and if hospitality gets up and running again in any significant way, they foresee that there are going to be problems there and difficulties. Um, Holliers have said that if it comes to customs declarations that would be needed um, whenever the parcel um, grace period comes to an end, they wouldn't have the capacity to, to deal with that uh, at the minute. So 
Um, really, the best way that we can support business at the minute is by making representations um, to the government and, and also to the EU to make them aware of the problems that we are facing as a result of this and the, the potential solutions that could be there to uh, to help us. And I think it's that's the most important job that we have right now uh, as ministers is to make people um, in places of responsibility aware um, within government of, of the actions that they can take. Okay, and, and thanks, Phil, because that actually just leads into my final question then, Gordon, which is that um, whenever the First and Deputy First Minister were with us, um, the First Minister very specifically made reference several times to the fact that Northern Ireland had observer status at the Joint Committee. Uh, now, under MDNA, I think there might have been a suggestion that whenever it came to matters relating to the protocol, that we would have certainly more than observer status to be able to articulate the problem may uh, be happening and then to try and find some sort of solution to them. So just maybe, what, what would your understanding be of the difference between that observer status and, and actually being able to raise the issues and the problems that are actually there and make sure that they're raised? Well, look, I, th I think maybe that's a bit of a, a technicality there in terms of the the, the wording of, of observer. It's been the case, and I think we have briefed the committee on this before, um, that we have, um, on behalf of the First and Deputy First Minister, um, been part of those committees before. It's certainly not the case that we are spectators and that we sit there and that we just listen. Um, in all of those meetings, whenever there have been Northern Ireland issues on the agenda, not only are we there, but we have been invited to comment, and that has been a good avenue in which we can make our concerns um, and views known, and the First and Deputy First Minister have certainly taken those um, opportunities to express um, the concerns that we have and the actions that we think uh, need to be taken. And it's my understanding and it's my expectation, Mr Chairman, that that will continue. Um, into the future, and we'll continue to be able to make contributions um, uh, to those meetings. It's not just the um, Vice President and the Chancellor um, of, of, the, of the Duchy of Lancaster that contribute to those meetings. Others are brought in. We're part of that, and that's exceptionally uh, important that we continue to have the ability to do that. Okay, that's good. Good. Okay, I'm happy enough for that answer. Maybe just a move. On then, unless Declan, have you anything you want to add to that, or could it go to Doug Beatty now and get a question from from him? Uh, it'll well, take just, just I, a I, few I seconds. Add a very, I'll add a very quick supplementary yeah. to what Gordon has said, uh, Colin. There are a whole series of new institutional mechanisms that are uh, now going to have to be put in place to ensure governance and operational oversight in relation to uh, how we move forward in the coming period. And uh, one of the provisions uh, references the, the space for civic society, for business organisations, our producers, our manufacturers to actually have a direct input uh, to those mechanisms. We have already made the case uh, directly at the XO committee that that should be provided for, and that our officials and our ministers also should be given full access to all of those mechanisms to ensure that our interests are properly represented. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So maybe if the communication team would move Doug Beatty up into the spotlight, then we will move to Doug and get his question. So over to yourself, Doug. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and I hope you can all hear me. And thank you, Gordon uh, and Declan. Um, uh, I mean, your engagement is always is always first class, uh, and I am impressed with the work that you are are putting into this. Uh, I suppose the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, and the Irish Sea Borders is always going to be divisive and people will have different views uh, in regards to that and I accept that and I, I will work with that. We're always going to be difficult when you save off a part of a nation uh, and say there will be something different, but that's uh, a long story. Can I just maybe ask for a sit-up of where we are in regards to the Joint Committee Working Group and the Specialist Working Group? Yes, Doug, uh, would you like me to come in just on that point? Colin, shall I? Yes, go on, go on, yeah, thank sir, you. Declan. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, well, it flows from the last, the last point that I was making in relation to the new institutional mechanisms, uh, Doug. 
uh, the, the joint consultative working group will now have to come into its own because it, it had a very practical uh, operational remit designated it and the uh, executive uh, will be uh, sitting on that particular body. Uh, the, the need then for that to be supplemented by ensuring that our interests are properly inter represented on the other uh, institutional mechanisms the governance mechanisms that uh, need to come into play under the terms of the, the, the protocol and as relevant to the withdrawal agreement all now come into focus. Gordon, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, look, I think, I think that sets it out. Um, it's very clear, um, set out in NDNA and uh, within the um, legislation as well. Um, that Northern Ireland executive ministers have an interest in the ongoing governance of the Northern Ireland Protocol and officials will be invited as part of the UK delegation of the Joint Consultative uh, Working Group. So um, we have our place in that and um, uh, we will take part in that whenever um, those opportunities arise. And as, as we've said already, Doug, there's, there's plenty of issues for us to, to raise. Yeah, and, and, I, and I guess... I guess the point I'm making is, uh, I mean, we're coming to a month into into this, and, and there's a long, long way to go. Yeah, and I just don't get a sense that the joint committees and the specialist, uh, the joint, joint committee working group and the specialist working group are actually sitting there coming up with solutions to the problems uh, that are that are being created. I mean, I'm not seeing any real solutions being being put out. That's not a dig at either you or Gordon or, or, or yourself, Declan, but I, I, I just don't get that sense that they are there now with a footprint in creating solutions. Um, and, and how far away will they be before they do start creating solutions to the problems that we have? Well, I think that's a valid point to, to raise, Doug. Uh, the, the reality is that we have a curtain of bureaucracy which has now been created between uh, trade uh, uh, in terms of trade between Britain and the EU, and and then in relation to uh, uh, trade between uh, the North, uh, in fact the, the the island of Ireland and Britain on an east-west and a west-east basis, and truth be told, n no one really knows what the mid to longer term consequences of that will in fact be. Uh, so. Uh, the the need for a strategic focus and emphasis to be brought on bottoming out these issues to ensure, as I indicated earlier, that we don't find ourselves at a cliff edge uh, at the end of the first grace period or the second grace period is really important. At this point in time, uh, our our focus has been absorbed into the daily uh, uh, exit operations meetings. And I think that uh, they've been useful insofar as they give us the ability to make representations and to find uh, tactical fixes, uh, immediate or practical uh, resolutions to some of the initial pinch points. But there are broader strategic issues that are going to flow in relation to the, oper the operation of the protocol relative to the withdrawal agreement. And what that means in specific terms, in a very practical sense, for uh, supply chains operating effectively between Britain and, and Ireland and ensuring that, our, for example, our service sector does not, in fact, become uh, in any way diminished in terms of its ability to work uh, on, a, on an all-island cross-border basis or, or into the EU itself. I would just add to that, um, Doug, we, we have committed to informing the committee about when meetings of the joint and specialised committees have taken place, our involvement in that, and we're happy to do the same with the uh, joint consultative working group so that you're kept informed uh, of those as well. Uh, th thank you to you both. And uh, can I just uh, raise another point? And, and, and people may think that uh, we've got lots of time to deal with this one, but I've raised it before, and, and maybe I'm just sort of going to say this so you're absolutely <laughs> alive. But the EMA are going to make a decision that the European me medicines, uh, whatever, the European people who, who, who um, decide on what medicines are allowed and not allowed, they are making a decision on the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine on Friday. What happens if they say no? 
What happens if they don't commission it on Friday? What happens in 12 months' time um, if it's not commissioned with the EU and we in Northern Ireland are so reliant on it? Are people alive to that particular issue um, as we speak? I'll come in on that. Uh, sorry. sorry for the delay here because I, I can't, I don't have eyes on here. Yes, we certainly are, uh, Doug, ourselves. We, we had a difficulty, uh, I think it was last week, at the end of last week, uh, in relation to uh, medicines being brought in uh, from Britain uh, to, uh, to Dublin, which, which, which were held up. Uh, they were meant to uh, to move on to the city hospital in Belfast, and also in relation to uh, uh, the, I think it was Alt McElvin in Derry. Thankfully, that problem got resolved. But we're certainly very tuned into the fact that uh, the the implications that we're now living with are very very widespread indeed. And when we talk in terms of of COVID uh, and uh, our approach to ensuring that we've got effective strategies for dealing with the pandemic and vaccinations are clearly front and centre in relation to that. It's essential that we're not in any way limited in our ability to access, access uh, those new vaccines coming on stream. Absolutely essential. Thank you, Dickel. OK, Gordon, have you anything to add to that? No. Okay. Doug, is that Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Doug. What we'll do now is we'll ask communications to move Martina Anderson up into the spotlight, please, so we can get some questions from Martina then. I think that's me unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both ministers for your presentations. And Gordon, you'll not be surprised to hear that uh, I don't agree that with you. I think blaming the protocol for the mess of Brexit lacks credibility. But you and I will agree to disagree on that one. I was, I was listening, Gordon, to what you said about the two unilateral declarations, one from the EU, and the other one from the British government, both agreed in December, which thankfully did offer us a grace period. Now, I would like to ask you about the, uh, the issue of being full, the full compliance post the grace period, because we had, for instance, in the infrastructure minister, a meeting with the hauliers and traders and they're looking for a derogation, an extension of the grace period, all the things that we know that the British government has unilaterally declared that it prohibits itself from asking for an extension. So it goes back to what Minister Kearney, Mr. Lyons, what you were saying about the day one readiness, because I'm concerned that businesses may not be taking this opportunity and using the grace period wisely. So building on the work that you have done, both of you, uh, could you could you talk to us about um, how businesses are being prepared and encouraged not to waste this opportunity of the grace period to make sure that they are prepared for the 1st of April, 1st of July, and then next year? Well, look, the, in, in terms of your opening uh, comments, um, I would say, yes, it's absolutely not the case that we're not going to see uh, eye to eye on this. Uh, I think we it's fair to say we don't see eye to eye on, on most things. And um, I certainly do not believe that the protocol was ever the inevitable consequence uh, of Brexit. And um, there was an awful lot of talk for quite some time about the importance of protecting uh, the Good Friday uh, Belfast Agreement. Um, but of course, the protocol um, rips that uh, to shreds and has done a huge amount of damage uh, to that agreement that so many people said would be uh, protected uh, in two main ways. Obviously, it changes the uh, status of uh, Northern Ireland uh, without the consent uh, of its people in regards to Northern Ireland's place uh, within the United Kingdom and within the United Kingdom's uh, market. And secondly, as we have seen over the last number of days, uh, the way in which safeguards um, that were built in that many would have argued were a core component um, of the Belfast Agreement um, have been taken away on this one particular uh, issue. 
Um, so it was never the case um, that the protocol was the inevitable consequence uh, of Brexit. And uh, it has done damage to the Good Friday Agreement that so many people say that they uh, support. Grace periods are um, welcome while they are here. Um, but regardless of um, how long they go on for, it still leaves us in an exceptionally difficult place once they end. And it is going to cause as hauliers and as businesses and as interested sectors have told us, um, a huge amount of difficulty uh, whenever they come to an end. So I think that we need to be looking for alternative solutions um, as well. I, I think that we need to uh, uh, highlight these concerns as we have been doing uh, with our government. And at the same time, I think there needs to be uh, conversations uh, with the uh, European Union about the difficulty um, of um, implementing uh, these and the, the problems that will come as a result of them being um, being put into into place. Uh, th these are not concerns that I am making up. It's not something that I'm pulling out of the air. It's what we got directly uh, from those that are, are going to be most uh, affected uh, by them. And I think the important thing for us uh, in all of this, and the important thing for the EU, I understand that they will say that they want to protect their single market, but we want to protect um, our trading relationship with the rest of the UK. And I think that there needs to be common sense shown when it comes to goods that are coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland and have no risk of entering into the EU, um, we need to see an awful lot more flexibility there and we need to see a change uh, in, in approach. Um, but I'm sure Declan will have his, his view on this as well. Thanks, Gordon. I suppose we can best describe where we're at as a, a, a new... Uh, a new uncharted territory. Uh, we do have uh, the shape of the withdrawal agreement. We do have the uh, the need to ensure that the um, uh, the, the the protocol is, is fully implemented. Uh, th there is, as a result of the uh, the trade and cooperation agreement, a fair bit of work which still needs to be sized uh, by our officials in terms of just working out what the consequences uh, of it all will be. But I do think that the the need for regular intensive engagement with the British government uh, and their officials, also with the Irish government and, and key Irish officials, is essential. But beyond that, I think we have to stay very closely engaged with the, the European Commission as well, uh, because I do think that the uh, European Commission was highly sensitive uh, to all of the relevant issues that affect uh, ourselves in this regional economy, uh, the implications of withdrawal for the operation, the functionality of the of the island economy. So we need to be remaining engaged with all of the relevant stakeholders and the players. And in, and and in the event that uh, the British government can be persuaded, if we haven't made up the ground necessary to seek extensions to the grace periods, and I don't know how likely or probable that would be, uh, then uh, that the access is available for that to be to be carried through. Uh, I detect uh, on the British government side, for those ministers and officials who are at the coalface of dealing with the immediate uh, readiness and uh, mid, uh, short to mid-term operational issues, uh, an appreciation of the complexity that needs to be navigated here. My fear is that others uh, within the uh, the British cabinet uh, may simply see this as deal done, uh, job done, let's move on, uh, and, and, in, and in an irresponsible way, paying scant regard to the bits that have to be picked up as a direct result of uh, withdrawal having been finalised. And to that extent, then, I think it's, it's incumbent on all of ourselves, all of the parties in our executive and, and in the chamber, regardless to our differences over the, the, the calamity of Brexit uh, being foisted upon us to work together to ensure that we do protect supply chains, we protect the, the all-island supply chains, that we ensure 
that trade moves back and forward between Britain and Ireland in as seamless a way as possible. And it probably would be useful, uh, Colin, um, for the committee to receive an update. I don't have time to do it now. I mean, I I could do so, but I'm conscious that time's pressing on. Uh, To get an an assessment of uh, how our officials grade achievement uh, at this point relative to the key priorities that were set down by the executive uh, based upon the needs of our own regional economy, uh, manufacturers, producers and and local businesses. And uh, the assessment of achievement is quite useful uh, because it indicates clearly where uh, there was a fair bit of progress made or we we, we ensured that our priorities were, were completely fulfilled, where they were partially fulfilled or where we actually have situations where on matters such as rules of origin uh, that are that are integral to uh, trying to get a zero tariff, zero quota system in place, where that actually has not been achieved. So it's a mixed bag of uh, achievement, semi-achievement, and then uh, no achievement at all. But I, I do think it informs us all from a political and also from a public policy perspective. And, and that's perhaps something that could be followed through uh, with yourselves, Colin, and for members on the committee by our officials. Um, Chair, I, I know you'll not want me to open the constitutional question because that's where the consent principle is very firmly rooted in the Good Friday Agreement. And Gordon, you and I may agree or, and disagree on things, but I think on the things we disagree, we can do so respectfully. Um, I think with regards to the new uncharted territory that Declan, you mentioned I'm very conscious of Brexiteers who ran the Folk Leave campaign, like Jacob Rees-Mogg. Because as soon as the trade agreement was signed, he moved his businesses out of Britain and into the south of Ireland so that they could be closer to operate in the EU. And therefore, I think that businesses, even someone like Jacob Rees-Mogg, business people are very pragmatic when it comes to the decisions that they have to make. So I'm looking at Ross Lair and the increase in the business traffic flow there over the last few weeks has been six weeks or sixfold of an increase. Some of the supermarket chains are bypassing the Britain's land bridge and they're bringing in fruit and vegetables directly from the continent via Ross Lair. So is that part of the preparation work that is going on with the traders so that they can see where they can get their supply chain and it's the interdepartmental working group looking at how for instance even if it's strengthening the all-ireland economy i hope it does and i do want the the east-west economy working as well as we can get it uh, and not better so i would just like to know if that opportunity is being looked at around loss ross lair and that traders and hauliers are being directed towards that as a possible solution for some of the problems. Well, I can only speak, uh, Martina, to the to the representations that we have had from businesses, and um, the representations that we have had are um, from those that are wanting um, to see that easier access between GB and NI. Um, that's what they have have lost. And that's what they're trying to get back because that's what's best for consumers. That's get get their their their, their products in. Um, we've always had opportunities to um, source um, goods from uh, from other routes, um, but that's not the problem right now. The problem is the barriers that has been up put up on the regulatory border in the Irish Sea. So that's what they want to see more than anything else is to see that eased and and back to a position of where it was uh, b- before. And um, that's what we should be trying to do to help because, um, you know, I don't want to rehearse old arguments either, but it's very clear where the majority of um, our trade or who the majority of our trade uh, is with. It's it's GBNI and vice versa. And um, we shouldn't be turning our back um, on that market and just try to source things from elsewhere whenever the easiest thing would be um, is to make sure that we have that um, ease of trade between uh, GBNN, and that's certainly the representations that, that we are getting at this moment in time. 
Chair, could we ask for an update, maybe if the two junior ministers don't have it in front of them, but perhaps you could um, send us through an update about the Shared Prosperity Fund. We heard from the 11 councils. We know that there are millions and millions of funding of, of pounds of European funding going to be lost as a consequence of being taken out of the EU. We were told that the British government would replace that fund. Those councils are looking for it replaced. We've heard from the finance minister it's a standstill budget. Uh, we've also heard from the Minister of the Economy that there's going to be 70 million lost. Finance uh, has telling us the same around other departments. Tenth, tenth T is going to be lost for the Department of Infrastructure. So could we get some kind of an update as to how we are going to um, deal with the loss of over a tranche of um, seven years? It's 3.5 billion of European funding. Yeah, obviously, I, um, I don't have all of those figures to to hand. Um, however, um, working with the Department for Finance, I think it would be possible for us to get you um, some information uh, on that. And rather than take up time now, I think that would be Thanks. easier to do for us to, to sign that off and get that through to the committee, Mr. Chairman. Okay, that would be appreciated, Martina. Thank you very much. Um, what we'll do then is we'll ask the communication team to bring Trevor Clark up in the spotlight and get you ready to ask some questions there, Trevor, go ahead. Is that it now? Yep, that's you now, Trevor, go on ahead. Okay. I, I suppose following on, I actually picked up on what uh, Minister Lyons has said in response to Martina about Ross Lair, and I think he was slightly diplomatic, to be fair. Um, he was right in saying, of course, that they want the barriers removed. But what Martina forgot or omitted to say is Ross Lair, whilst it may be up sixfold now, the hauliers have said it's more expensive, it's taking longer, and it's unreliable because of weather conditions. So if Martina is happy that Northern Ireland gets a supply through lost Ross Lair, which will be interrupted in bad weather, well, I suppose that's an issue for her. But, but I, I agree with what Minister uh, Lyons had said in response to that, except that part was omitted. The, the other question I suppose I want to ask maybe directly to Minister Lyons was, uh, and whilst there is a diver divergence of opinions, it seems maybe from Michelle O'Neill's quote on Monday where she said that the executive supported the rigorous implementation of the protocol. Is that the position, is that the joint position of the First and Deputy First Minister? Okay, well, just to come in on, on your first point, um, I, th I think it's absolutely right, uh, Trevor, the, the, the arguments that you make there, because it goes back to both consumer choice and consumer costs that are both impacted um, by losing that ease of access uh, across the Irish Sea, and I completely agree. Uh, in regards to your comments in relation to what the uh, Deputy First Minister said in the Assembly, um, uh, was it, I think it was either Monday or Tuesday at, at question time, um, yeah, I believe that the, uh, the, the Deputy First Minister uh, misspoke uh, on that occasion. I think it's been very clear um, that um, it's not the executive's position that we support the rigorous implementation uh, of the protocol. That's a party political um, position on behalf of the Alliance, the SDLP uh, and Sinn Féin. Um, I tend to um, prefer the approach that the, that the government took actually within its... Um, paper uh, that was produced um, following the uh, agreement at the end of December, uh, where it says um, that they seek to implement the protocol in a flexible and proportionate way. Um, they also talk about um, a pragmatic approach and um, con consensual and proportionate. Um, I think the protocol itself uh, as well talks about the um, protocol being implemented in such a way um, that the impact or it impacts as little as possible on communities and the everyday life of communities um, uh, in Northern Ireland. And I think uh, as well, you have to look at our record uh, so far over, over the last month in particular, we, we are looking for flexibility. We are looking um, for this to be implemented in such a way while the protocol is here. And I hope that the protocol isn't always here, but while it is here, um, I see it as my job not to rigorously implement it, um, but to get the mitigations necessary to protect consumers, to protect businesses, uh, and to protect jobs uh, as well. And I think if you look at some of the things that we are taking to the government in terms of problems that we've been experiencing and um, the uh, 
changes that we want to see uh, take place. It's very much my view that we need to take that pragmatic approach. And indeed, in the meetings that we had with hauliers and with, with business groups, um, words that came up time and time again were, you know, we need flexibility, we need pragmatism. And um, if we're really concerned uh, about protecting our people, protecting our businesses, protecting consumers and consumer choice, um, then we need to take uh, that, that approach um, while the protocol uh, is in place. But no, I can certainly confirm um, that is not a, a, an executive uh, position that was articulated. I hope that's helpful. Okay, and I suppose maybe kind of follow on there, um, and, and that, that is useful, I suppose, and I can understand the whole idea of flexibility, but maybe could the Minister's comment there on Brandon Lewis's comment um, around the, 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 our supermarkets super, super been empty more on the basis of the coronavirus than Brexit, and given that's clearly not the experience of many of the retailers themselves who have seen, obviously, quite to the contrary of that. Yeah. Um, and and I suppose, do we, do we believe that Brandon Lewis is an honest broker in this as well? Well, certainly I do um, think that there was a very limited at the start. There may have been reasons due to the problems pre-Christmas in um, Calais that there was perhaps some impact there. Uh, however, it is the case that there is... Um, a lack of choice now we're not we're not we, we don't have food shortages we're not running out of food uh, at this moment in time but there's no doubt um, that there is lack of choice and there is a huge amount of concern uh, there among many people in northern Ireland. you'll have seen it trevor as a constituency representative and as someone that maybe does the shopping as well you can see products that were previously available that aren't available now and and it's inevitable that that has taken place and another concern that we have is in relation to uh, what we have been told that up to um, there's 30 to 40 percent less loads returning to Northern Ireland. Everything's being shipped out from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, but it's not coming back in the same measure as it's it's going out, and that's causing a, a huge uh, amount of problems uh, for our hauliers. And uh, it's inevitable that some of that's going to factor in uh, to our supermarkets uh, as well. Um, you know, the Secretary of State is someone who um, we talk to frequently. Um, and that we are putting these these points across. Certainly within our XO meetings, um, he has been helpful insofar as both him and Robin Walker, who attend those meetings on behalf of the NIO, have, have been supportive in some of the issues that we have been uh, raising. Um, however, it is the case that the protocol is, is causing problems and sometimes there is a lack of willingness to um, recognise um, that the, the protocol is causing long-term problems that aren't simply just teething problems. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come in on that. Oh. Sorry, Trevor, were you about to yeah, no, go, go, go ahead, sorry, thank you. Go ahead. I, I don't think that there's any purchase in, in us going down the rabbit hole of uh, differences of opinion on the, on the executive and this committee and... Uh, within the executive itself and in the chamber, they're, they're all well enough rehearsed. There's there's a fundamental difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. The reality is that the majority of parties and MLAs see the necessity of the, the protocol and for it to be implemented and, and opposed to the, the very we're opposed to the very idea of Brexit from, from the outset. That said, we do have to be pragmatic. Uh, what's essential from my point of view is that we protect supply chains that we avoid costs being uh, imposed on our people, of consumers, arising from uh, the, the new changed economic and commercial trading environment that we find ourselves in. The protocol is the least worst option uh, in these circumstances, but as I said earlier on, the British government negotiated Brexit, they negotiated the withdrawal agreement, they negotiated the protocol, they did it with their eyes wide open. Perhaps if uh, there had been a more enlightened approach taken by some members of the British cabinet who were there at that time towards the issue of the backstop negotiated with Theresa May. We actually wouldn't be looking at the, the kind of curtains of bureaucracy that I mentioned, Trevor, that applies to trade between Britain and the EU and then trade between this island and Britain with all of the implications as for uh, trading on an east-west and a west-east basis. Uh, so our, our job needs to be uh, to deal with the situation we now find ourselves in. 
it was a it was a, a bad negotiation to pick up on your question around Brandon Lewis, and I agree with uh, Gordon's uh, assessment uh, of, uh, of 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 what he said. Um, but the truth of it is, and I mentioned this earlier, I think that some within the the British cabinet, within the British government system, now recognise uh, the shape of what uh, the withdrawal agreement means. Not not. Uh, even for businesses here in this island or in this region, but for businesses in Britain itself. The, the Guardian actually reported at the weekend that British businesses that are exporting to mainland Europe are now being encouraged by British government trade advisors to set up separate companies inside the EU in order that they can get around the extra charges and the bureaucracy and the paperwork and the taxes that arise for them from, uh, from Brexit. And, uh, and 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 those are small business businesses that have been informed that by advisors that are actually working for the Department of International Trade, and I think that speaks volumes about the situation that we find ourselves in. So while there are differences between all of us, I think we have to find the common ground, and the common ground must be to protect, uh, to maximise supply chains, ensure that the costs aren't thrown on to the consumer and the customers living here. Uh, in this region or across the island, and that we make the uh, the best of a bad <clears throat> that has been foisted on us uh, by some elements of the British government, I think, who carried out a very reckless negotiation and are now riding off into the sunset, whilst other members of the British government, in fact, I think, recognise some of the real uh, time, real world practical difficulties that have been created. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, and I hear what you're saying, no, and, and I accept, and I suppose on all of these things, we can be on different sides. Equally, we're on a different side in terms of the Belfast Agreement. You were on one side and I was on the other, but how would you respond then to where the NIO have now NI confirmed they tweaked the Belfast Agreement to allow the protocol to work? Uh, listen, when it comes to the management of the uh, our peace and political processes in the North, I have absolutely no faith in uh, the, the, this Tory government that came to power since 2010. I think that it, they have been a net contributor to so much of the political instability that we have had over the course of that 10-year period that, in my view, has been uh, unnecessarily exacerbated by the approach that has been taken to Brexit, the decision, the negotiations from the backstop through to the protocol. and. Uh, the reality is that they, they passed uh, the, uh, the Internal Market Act and Brandon Lewis was the cheerleader for this position on the basis that, if necessary, they were prepared to specifically breach international law and that has the direct repercussion for the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement. That was clearly implicit and uh, explicit in what he meant. So, frankly speaking, I think that we're far better governing ourselves uh, even though we have divided the political opinion, we're far better governing ourselves and taking our own counsel in relation to how all of these political economic issues are taken forward without uh, bad advice or, for that matter, uh, nefarious interference on the behalf of certain British government ministers or other sections of the British state. I hear you're saying, Dylan, but on one hand, you're, you're criticising them for actually going to break one agreement However, the Belfast Agreement, which you signed up and supported, which I didn't, you seem to be silent on the fact that they have tweaked it to actually get this wonderful protocol, as many of you see it. I mean, again, we're in a different opinion on that. But it's interesting, on the one hand, you're saying that they, have, they were going to do things, break international law, but it's quite OK because they can, they can tweak the Belfast Agreement to allow this protocol to work, which is ultimately damaging Northern Ireland. Listen, I think okay, I'm going to intervene there, Declan. That there wasn't a question there; it was a statement, and it was Trevor Forsco in there. So I'm going to ask if we could bring Emma Sharon up in spotlight. And uh, at this stage, she's the the last person has the hand up. So hopefully, we'll be getting towards because we are moving on. We're about 25 minutes over time, at stage, and we do have uh, Joan Ryan in the audience, and I want to be detaining her longer than we have to. So, Emma, I'll pass over to yourself for your questions. 
Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, hint duly noted around uh, timekeeping and the amount of time that has been spent thus far. Um, thanks to, to both the ministers for the presentation this afternoon. And I know we've had a lengthy conversation at this point. And I suppose to me, the conversation around protocol, Brexit, who's at fault here, we can get bogged down in the detail of this. To me, anybody at this point in time focusing on on the protocol as the cause uh, for for our woes here it's it's like burning your house down to the ground and then complaining about the the damage caused by by water from fire extinguishers that the, there wouldn't be a protocol if it, if it wasn't for brexit but we can get bogged down in that and the fact that the north didn't vote to leave the eu or we can have a conversation around what we're going to do here to make the best of a bad situation so to that end, I want to ask um, the, the ministers what sort of conversations have been held with the, the business community and the, the people that are involved in, in securing supply chains here. I, I note that during the, the presentation that we had from the, the Joint First Ministers, um, Arlene Foster had referred to the opportunity that had arisen, the, the big example at that stage in the, in the first week or two after Brexit was the fact that Sainsbury's in the North who previously imported all their milk from England, which to me is bizarre if you take Ireland as a country with a massive reliance on agriculture. And if you go back 60 years, pretty much every rural household uh, in Ireland would have would have had nearly their own cow or would have been would have been able to, to produce that within the household that we're now in a situation where we were importing milk that, that now Henderson were, were getting business from that, 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 that they had changed suppliers. And there are going to be examples of that across the board. I, know I was speaking to an egg producer during the week who was telling me about the fact that we don't have any day-old chicks in Ireland. All of the day-old chicks that are, are used for egg production across the island of Ireland were imported from England. Again, another bizarre reality um and so to try and and look you know within whether it be within the north or you know north and south uh solutions to, to these problems uh, because taking the politics out of it i suppose if, if you look at energy usage and just the whole efficiency the idea that you'd be transporting things like that obviously we're always going to have to import bananas and passion fruits when you when you when you live in, in, a, in a place that has a climate that, that we have but to, to try and look at the solutions with, within the island um more cost effective and, and all the rest of it so i wanted i wanted to know if, what conversations have been held at, at that level and what progress was being made there? I think that's one of the Sorry. Go Sorry, go ahead, Declan. I'll, I'll just be brief. I think that's one of the strategic conversations that we need to take forward, Emma, in the time ahead. Uh, reverting back to the point I made about us uh, having to have a very clear focus on protecting uh, the resilience of our supply chains, ensuring that they work for us, that we have a pragmatic approach to ensuring that uh, business isn't, isn't endangered, that we don't end up uh, making uh, life more difficult for consumers and customers and uh, taking more money out of their pockets. So it does put a focus on how do we uh, develop uh, greater levels of effective supply chains on, on an all-island basis. But at the heel of the hunt, this is about ensuring that uh, we are, our, our regional economy is not adversely affected, that we do have access to the supply chains that we need on an east-west, west-east and north-south basis with the, the minimal amount of disruption and difficulty. And to that extent, I do think that we're going to have to, and I said this earlier, we're going to have to remain very closely engaged in discussions with the European uh, Commission. But by the same token, I think that uh, just as we have, I think, reasonably effectively made an impression uh, on uh, some of the more pragmatic and workmanlike elements uh, within solution-focused individuals within the British government through the XO on a, on a daily basis, we're going to have to have some real-world conversations about what all island supply chains look like. Uh, in terms of them being upscaled with the Irish government in the time ahead. And, and, I, and I see that on the basis of uh, economies of scale, making sure that uh, consumers have choice uh, and that they're getting best value for money in the process. 
Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> if I could just come in on that, I suppose, first of all, um, Emma couldn't resist the temptation to say a few words on the protocol, so I'm also not going to be able to resist uh, the temptation just to say that I, I, I do fundamentally disagree again, and I want it um, very firmly placed on the record, um, that I do not believe that the protocol uh, was an inevitable consequence uh, of Brexit. It was um, called for, it was agitated for, and um, now people are asking for the rigorous implementation of it. And I believe that that will be the, to the detriment of people in Northern Ireland and the other alternatives um, to deal with the changing relationships um, were identified and could have been implemented in a way that would be causing far fewer problems than what we have now with the protocol. However, I don't believe I'm going to be able to convince Emma or others uh, on the call about this uh, today. Um, to answer then the specific question that she raised, you know, we certainly do have um, an awful lot of um, interaction and uh, listening to other businesses. I hope that that has come across in what we have said today, that we are always um, trying to, to help um, businesses in that way. But And I suppose I would just say as well, um, uh, I, I want to get rid of... Um, of, of that friction between Great Britain and Northern Ireland so um, that there can be an uh, easier flow of trade than there is right now. Obviously, I, I think that we have some of the best um, milk and dairy products in the world here in Northern Ireland, and I'd, I'd be very, very happy and pleased to see um, more people uh, using the local produce that we have supplied. I'm not sure if it's a, a Sinn Féin policy now, free cows for everybody, and we're trying to go back to uh, what we might have had in, uh, across rural uh, Ulster a, a number of years ago. Um, but certainly, um, absolutely, we want to help our, our local suppliers, and I would encourage people uh, to do that and to support uh, our local farmers, but we, we shouldn't allow um, that to stop us from wanting to make sure that we have that free uh, trade and, and that consumer choice um, with, with with our biggest market as well. That's me, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, yeah, happy Do you have anything further? No, that's me. It's it's not it's not free cows for everyone. But just for everyone. I think that we're, that we're important things like that. Well, I'd like to say that I, I am somewhat glad to hear that because I can look out here into what is a very small back garden, and I don't think I would have much for a cow in there at all. And I, I suppose as well, maybe just to and to comment that um, Minister, we we don't always disagree on because. You know, I don't think that the protocol was an inevitable outworking of Brexit. There were there were many other options that were voting them down, uh, and probably would have been uh, much uh, more palatable than the situation that we found in the minutes. But, gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you for your time today. I, we've taken you a little longer than we expected due to the uh, technical difficulties at the start of the meeting. Uh, it's always easy to participate. Uh, in these meetings by, by Mr. Kearney, we appreciate you uh, making the sacrifice so that you could be with us, and also to Minister Lyons, who looked at the going zone for the whole meeting, so I know that that would have been uh, very difficult at the beginning, but th thank you both very much, and I'm sure we'll see you both again very soon. You, you will call on an uh, for, for, for uh, apologies uh, for apology. technical difficulties at the outset. I hope that it didn't adversely impact on the uh, the quality uh, or the flow of presentation and the discussion then that we, we, we had afterwards. No, that was grand. Thank you. So look, we let the communication team uh, take yourselves out of the spotlight there for you. And um, if we then will move um, Fiona Ran up into the spotlight. Um, I think we're, there we go, we have one of you to see you, you're very welcome. Um, I hope that your signal will uh, stay with us and give us the, the, the presentation today. Uh, we want to uh, welcome you in your uh, new role as a commissioner. Uh, you just took up a position uh, before Christmas and are in your role. Um, and I've had an opportunity to make some key um, agencies and, and, and people involved uh, in the area for the remit. Uh, we're delighted to get the opportunity maybe to, to hear a few words yourself in terms of your priorities and uh, 
what's going to take place in the, the months and uh, years ahead. So what we'll do, uh, just as if it was in, in the room, in the committee, we'll pass over to yourselves maybe to make a few uh, remarks to us and we'll open it to the floor for questions. From and if you're happy enough with that, I'll pass over to yourself. Um, thank you so much, Colin, and uh, to the committee um, members for having me. I'm just checking on sound levels here. Your sound was fading in and out. Am I okay? Okay. Um, so, again, uh, thank you for having me here. As you said, I'm the new Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse and took up post just before Christmas. Um, I guess before I start providing any overview of where we're at and where we're going, I want to start with um, making a profound thank you to the representatives of the victims and survivors groups whom I've met with. Um, they've been so gracious with their time and with their expertise. And when I say expertise, it's because they are the experts in their own lived experience. And they've shared that with me and also their concerns, which I hope to share with you further. But um, I think I'm mindful as we're having this conversation that it's taking place less than 24 hours after the publication of the mother and babies report. And I just want to, um, I suppose, extend my sympathies to all those impacted by the report and to say that um, I'm very conscious in any comments that I make here today, that this is the context that I'm making those comments in as well. So um, I started by saying I wanted to thank um, you and particularly the victims and survivors of institutional childhood abuse who I have met over the last number of weeks and who shared their experiences. I know that the members of the committee are deeply familiar with the issues for victims and survivors, but I think it's worth reiterating that victims and survivors of institutional childhood abuse endured pain, suffering and trauma at the most vulnerable time of their lives, the time when they most needed love, care and protection, a time when they were children. It's been a long road for the victims and survivors for a long time, you know, in common with their counterparts in the South. They had their experiences denied or minimized. They were robbed of by abusers and a system that facilitated abuse um, of agency and their rights taken away. And they've had to fight for their, um, for these lived experiences, for their realities, both as individuals. And I say that because survivors are more than just their experiences of abuse. They're individuals, but they also share common experiences with victims of domestic or of um, childhood abuse. And so consequently, I think it's worth understanding those individual experiences and the commonalities and how they interplay. And so we need to be aware of the fact that um, when we're talking, we're talking to people and their unique lived experiences. Um, like I said, I'm grateful and conscious of um, the realities of the victims and what they've experienced. But at the same time, I want to kind of reach out and send a message as well, because the fact is, we know from other forms of um, abuse, and I probably mistakenly alluded there to my experiences of working with domestic abuse. My previous role, I spent seven years um, being chief executive of the largest frontline service provider to women and children experiencing domestic abuse in the Republic of Ireland. And um, half our clients would have been children, and one in five of our women clients would have been victims of sexual violence in the context of domestic violence. And I realized in that, and we know from international best practice and experience, that 80% of victims of abuse will not disclose their experiences to agencies. Um, in fact, they might not even tell their own loved ones. And so I'm very conscious that as I've been privileged to engage with victims and survivors groups, that there is much, much larger constituency of victims and survivors out there who will never disclose their experiences to anyone. Um, I think the reality of that is that we need to risk, because I've obviously spoken to you and I've spoken to other um, MLAs as well, you know, and people have expressed, you know, how do we reach out? Well, we reach out by ensuring that when we do reach out, the services are there for victims and survivors. We also need to recognize that consent and agency are paramount in principle. And so um, I'm conscious of time here. I could go on talking about this, but I think that um, fundamentally any engagement that we have with victims and survivors needs to be founded on respect for agency and the principle of consent. 
do they want to disclose or not? And if they do, if they do, that those services are there and appropriate. And even if they don't, that the services that they may encounter are sufficiently trauma-informed that there is an awareness there so that they're not further re-traumatized. So you alluded at the start that, uh, yeah, we are, the Office of the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse is up and running for the last six weeks. And obviously, on a very prosaic level, we are focusing on organizational development. So we're focusing on developing our capacity so that we can um, carry on and move forward with our work as outlined, I suppose, in legislation, but also reflecting the concerns that victims and survivors have shared with us. So I guess the last uh, month has been spent engaging with victims and survivors and key stakeholders who are involved in service provision and um, statutory stakeholders as well, including TEO and the Redress Board. Um, it's been, like I said, in terms of building organizational capacity so we can put in the infrastructure to support victims and survivors um, around their um, issues, because that's the fundamental goal of our office, is to promote the interests of victims and survivors. Um, it's been a recruitment drive, which started on the 18th of January, and which we hope to be up to full capacity, probably by mid-March. And um, going forward, the priority, I think, of our of the office or the commissioner will be to establish a victims panel, again outlined in legislation. <coughs> Excuse me, and to ensure that's up and running. And then by the end of this year, to like I said, ensure that um, the victims panel is up and running. We have good working relationships with the statutory and non-statutory service providers, and um, we've established a means of communication and open communication. And then obviously there are other issues that are outside the remit of the, the legislation, which outlines the powers of the commissioner, but which reflect those of the heart inquiry, including the apology process. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It would help if I took myself off mute, sir. That it's a lot easier to be heard. Um, look, excuse me. Thank you very much for the presentation there. Um, I just missed a little bit at the end because we get something from the comms team there, but um, I think may have been um, sort of dovetailing across what I wanted to ask really about mm -hmm. maybe looking at your immediate three priorities that you have in your work stream, maybe just to give us a flavor of what sort of things you'll be working on as, as a key priority maybe in, in the next head. So, what, what are the sort of top three things on your what's in terms of, of, of your operation? Top three priorities are basically making sure that we are at full capacity as an agency. Right now, there um, we have three members of staff. The projected team is 10. Um, I'm delighted to be able to say that my colleagues are still maintaining their, um, the work they've been doing supporting victims and survivors around making their statements to the redress board. So we have been able to carry on with that, what we call personal support unit work. Um, I would hope that by the end of March, we would be at a full team complement. In terms of going forward there in a work program or a strategic plan, operational plan, we're looking at basically um, establishing the victims panel, which is outlined within the legislation. And effectively, it is there to facilitate consultation and discussion with victims and survivors. So that would be, I think, a key goal for the office this year in terms of setting it up. Um, going forward, you know, the victims and survivors have raised um, a number of concerns with me. And what I've been pursuing is obviously because the fundamental remit of this agency, this the commissioner's office, is to promote the interests of victims and survivors. So I've been looking at those concerns, grouping them and seeing how they can inform our work program going forward. Um, the concerns that have largely been raised with us are very much current concerns. And I suppose if I could impress anything on the committee, the reality is that you're talking about victims and survivors who've experienced abuse and trauma as children and have lived with the legacy of that trauma throughout their whole lives. Imagine if you broke your leg as a child and it was never set properly and you never received physio and you carried that pain around with you for your whole life. That's what you're talking about, except that's we're talking about not just physical, um, I guess, physical uh, reminders of abuse, but we're also talking about psychological, mental, impacting on relationships, all of those. 
And so you're talking about um, a community of people who've experienced horrendous abuse as children, who've lived with it as adults. And that community of individuals is actually, it's an aging population. I reached out to Margaret Bates and I'm very grateful to Margaret and her team in the VSS for some basic statistics on, um, on what victims and survivors are presenting to them. And, you know, you're talking about, well, first of all, it's equally um, split between genders, but you're talking about the vast majority of individuals engaging with services are over the age of 50 to 55. So you're talking about all the issues that you would have as you're getting older, compounded by being a victim of trauma and abuse, and then add on to that the potential socioeconomic deprivation you may have experienced as a result of those experiences. What I would be hoping for our office to do in the future, and obviously because we, um, we have those powers, is to commission a wider piece of research, which has happened in Scotland and Ireland amongst victims and survivors, regarding what are their presenting needs and to use that information then to inform um, health services, social welfare services, social care services, so that we're starting with an evidence base and an informed evidence base um, that's based on public health and demographics. But that will be perhaps year two. Year one is very much getting up to speed with the actual um, presenting. <laughs> Okay, th thank you for that. You, you mentioned about the staff and getting staff in place. Do you, uh, I mean, would you think at this stage that, that you have staff in comp once it, all the positions are filled, or would you envisage that you may need more staff to be able to deliver the work that you would like to do? That's a great question, Colin. I mean, I've already, in my past experience, done um, two startup organizations and a restructure. And I think at the moment, you don't know what you don't know. So right now we are making best guess. And what I would like to be able to do is report back to TO, to yourselves, say within six months to say, look, this is what we anticipated here in our first three months in operation. Here's what we've actually experienced. Um, for example, one of the needs, again, that's outlined in legislation, I've become very familiar with the Historic Institution of Abuse in Northern Ireland Act 2019, because it effectively outlines the powers of the commissioner and our statutory duties, is to facilitate um, individuals actually seeking information um, in relation to their records. Now, we know obviously there's PRONI there, and, um, but the reality is that um, this could potentially, going forward, be a huge area that we'll be asked to look into. And it's a complicated one, because again, as the mother and babies report showed, some of the information is not there or some of the records aren't there. So right now I can say to you, in the next three to six months, I believe the team that's in front of us is sufficient, but I can well be coming back to you in three to six months to say, based on need, we expect the following to be increased. Okay, yeah, that certainly makes sense. And, and maybe finally from myself, um, and this may be a difficult question to answer because of where you are in the stage of the process of, of establishing things, but given what was announced yesterday in terms of the mother and baby, um, the scandal that happened there, and, and the fact that even though there's going to be um, a six-month process to co-design the programme and, um, and, and the way forward for that, you know, I, I worry that six months plus a process being put in place plus, plus, plus ends up being a year, a year and a half, two years down the line. Many of those um, survivors from that process could be identified tomorrow. And I'm just wondering, in terms of support services that could be up, is there something through the work that you're doing and the services that you're providing, some way that maybe again with a little investment and a little enhancement of the team that very quickly support services could be offered to others. Is that capacity or that role similar enough that with a little bit of effort uh, and resources, you could be able to outreach in a very quick process and maybe hand that to somebody else in the future, but get very quickly a support services network available for those that are survivors of that mother and baby um, scandal? Is that something that might be possible? Thank you for that question, Colin. Um, I think, first of all, to establish what's um, possible in principle and then what's potentially possible in reality and, uh, you know, realistically. Um, obviously, there are huge overlaps 
between the victims of historical institutional childhood abuse and um, and indeed the um, victims who have gone through victims and survivors who have gone through the mother and baby homes. Um, not least of all, my understanding from the report yesterday is that a third of the, I'm going to say women, but actually they're more appropriately called children, were under the age of 19. And we know under the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child that an, that a child is basically an individual under the age of 18. So you're looking at children who give birth to children, and some of those as young as the age of 12, many of whom would have been victims as well of sexual violence and rape and incest and unlawful carnal knowledge. So in response, the first response I'd say to you is, you know, first do no harm. So while recognizing the similarities and indeed the, you know, moving from one institution to another, I think that this could be a very specialist area because of some of the presenting needs that um, the victims and survivors of the mother and baby homes um, will present with. Um, one of the areas that I've been asking about since I've arrived, and you're always in a privileged position, you're newly arrived in a post, because you can ask all the questions, <laughs> the really obvious questions. And so, for example, I've been asking, well, what specific specialist supports are available for victims of child sexual abuse, those who were sexually abused as children in the context of historical institutional abuse? And I've been waiting to hear back for a comprehensive assessment of what resources are there, because obviously I don't want to generalize from what's available in the Republic. Um, I think in relation to those potential services, once they emerge, we may see um, mother victims and survivors of the mothers and babies homes potentially having to engage in that respect. If you're asking um, in relation to my own, um, I suppose, uh, office at the moment, I'm very conscious that you know we were set up under a statutory remit and that's not me wanting to use legislation as an excuse to not take on additional work but i am conscious as well that we are set up to support victims of historical institutional childhood abuse okay and this is a community of people who waited a very long time for this work to be carried out so i guess i'm giving you a typical answer that in principle of course you could see that there would be huge parallels I don't want to preempt that specialist services may need to be provided, okay? And that the reality is that, you know, the office is there to support victims of historic institutional childhood abuse, and they are our current priority right now in terms of setting up the advisory panel. Um, going forward, and that probably, I was hoping to try, that, that my response in relation to that three to six months would allow for the mothers and babies, but you uh, very cleverly headed me off at the pass here. <laughs> So, um, look, I think we're not going to turn away anyone who comes to us, okay? To be very, we're, very, we're victim centered. I don't know if that answers okay. what you asked. Yep, that's Grant. Thank you very much indeed, for Fiona. I'm going to pass now and see if Doug is there. I would like to come in with any questions, Katie, if we could bring you up there. Thank you, um, Chair and Fiona. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, but but that was that was really good, actually. Um, thank you very much. I mean, so much information there, um, uh, and and you really have hit the ground running in regards to this. So so thank you for all that you've you've brought forward um, so far. C can I maybe ask a, a couple of things, um, Fiona, if if I may? Uh, and this is some of the feedback that we are getting from some of the victims. Uh, groups who myself and the chair have met with, who I've got to say are, are carrying themselves with uh, incredible dignity uh, throughout all of this. But one of the issues that they said was that the information that they were getting or the information flow that they were getting on their individual cases from the redress board maybe wasn't going at the at the level that they wanted it to, to, to be. Is there any way we can address that particular issue? Uh, and just to combine that, they also felt that there was... Um, you know, there, there was a little bit of lack of respect from certain elements of the redress board, and in fact, they were they were slightly disheartened by the historical background checks that that are being done in regards to them, which have got nothing to do with their particular case. Um, thanks so much, Doug. You're very kind. Um, I think you've the concerns that you've raised have been shared with me. I spent my last month. Um, I'm a good talker, as any woman from Cork is, but I'd like to think that I'm a better listener. And I've spent the last month basically listening and hearing 
and then listening and hearing again and taking that to taking on those concerns and actually ensuring that I'm reflecting them appropriately, you know, not my interpretation of the concerns. I'm very like yourselves. Um, so what I've done is, um, look, straight. I believe in straight talk, so, okay. What I've done is I will engage with the Secretary of the Redress Board and had a very open and frank conversation and said, here are the concerns that are being relayed to me. And I kind of grouped them thematically as well because, um, yeah, I suppose I'm a bit of a nerd and I thought, let's let's just do this. And basically the concerns that were expressed to me um, were very similar to what was expressed to you. And I would have grouped them under um, process concerns. So turnaround times, length of time wrong communications, um, and then getting into the whole awards and appeals um, and language used. You know, and I think maybe that goes to some one of the points that you raised when you are engaging with victims and survivors, you know, I think we have to start off with first principles. And if you get those first principles right, you can cascade. And even when you make mistakes and I'm going to put my hand up here and I'm sure I'll make mistakes, as commissioner, and my office will, but we'll own them and it won't be from lack of crying. But to understand where you're going and to go to use those first principles and the first principle is be victim centered be respectful you know and I have shared with the secretariat of the redress board those very what I consider legitimate concerns and actually I suppose they've listened they've taken them on board and they've offered um, to meet with the groups and they've and to hear those and in particular around the use of language and to be mindful of the fact that you know, this is not, when people are getting communications from the redress board, this is not a communication between a social worker and a doctor or a judge and a solicitor. There is a victim and survivor at the other end of that communication. There is a person who was abused as a child and has lived with that their whole lives. And to be mindful in any communication. So far, the redress board have been very open with me in terms of, um, I suppose, disclosing their statistics. Um, for example, they have two panels operating and I'm, I know that potentially they would look for a third panel to operate and this may make a positive impact in terms of turnaround times and reducing the distress caused by a very long process. And they've also, um, I don't know if this was cheeky or not, but you know, as they say, carry on till you're taught not to. Um, I went to the redress board and I suggested that um, we had a real opportunity with the new president coming in, um, Mr. Justice Ian Hiddleston, to, um, to engage and really hear from victims and survivors what was going on. And potentially as part of than having one-off engagements, particularly with the secretary of the redress board, that we can open up. And I would hope maybe potentially through the advisory panel, that's why I was emphasizing it to Colin, perhaps a more structured means of engagement to take those concerns forward. I don't know if that answers your a few uh, yeah, answers to your concerns, Doug. Fiona, it, it, it does, and it's absolutely clear to me that you're alive to this and you're you're already taking proactive action. So that's I mean that's always positive. If I could ask a very brief one then, sure. um, just something that's been raised. First of all, I, I actually had a presentation from the VSS about their service delivery model for survivors of historical historical institutional abuse. I, I thought it was very good. Yes. Um, the presentation. I think they've really got their act together uh, on this. But two issues with that, and, and of course, the, the the support is always difficult in the, the COVID environment we're in now. But there's always been this question, and we've raised it before uh, on this committee, about a funeral fund for those who have passed away before they've gone through the redress board. And I think we've had one uh, quite recently. Um, and I think that's something our executive may well have to take forward. Uh, I uh, I, our committee may have to take forward, um, but if it, is it something that you're looking at? And secondly, some of the, um, the, the, the survivors groups are maybe having their funding pulled um, in the next little while because the VSS is uh, support is up and running. Do you have any view on that e, as well? Um, again, great question, Doug. Um, first of all, I want to say, um, Margaret Bateson and her team in the VSS appear to be doing a sterling job. Margaret was the person actually and her team were able to provide me with those demographics, details, that information um, to allow us to actually look at what 
the needs are that are presenting and they're using very well established best practice um, social care model that I would be familiar with from my previous role in relation to those funeral costs. I think, it, I mean, I alluded to this earlier on. Um, while the institutions themselves that were under investigation by Hart spanned 1922 to 95, the reality is that as a community, this is an aging community, and this will present more as an issue for um, Northern Ireland Social Services, for the executive. What are we going to do for this population group? What are we going to do for this community of people? And you mentioned, so yes, it came on my radar, right, regarding the whole issue of burials and funeral costs. It is something that I would be looking to raise with the um, HIA team within the executive office. Um, I wanted to um, get more of an understanding of the issues involved, costs involved, and just to um, to be able to talk and find out what the capacity is. My understanding is this may have an implication for the Department of Communities. And um, yeah, so it is on my radar. I do think it's legitimate. I think it's going to be a growing issue in relation to this community of individuals as they get older. Um, in your relation to the grants, in relation to the grants if you can is this okay sorry i just note the it looks like it's dropping yeah. your, uh, it's dropping. Yeah. Um, obviously those grants have been um, within the remit of teo my view is um from my highly educated position of six weeks in the role that um that the grants that are involved are potentially um, crucial for the, the groups involved in terms of their capacity building, their outreach work. Um, so in principle, I wouldn't, I certainly would see um, a future for them. But um, since I don't have the authority over them, or, and I'm uh, unaware of the actual, um, shall we say, criteria, and say, um, I'm going to put a project plans that have been put in place um, around funding, I probably couldn't comment much more beyond that, except to say, I think that if it increases the capacities of victims and survivors to engage and to reach out, then it's a welcome thing. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Ross. Okay, I'm going to ask now for Martina to be brought up into the spotlight. And uh, yeah, Martina, if you want to go on ahead with your questions, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Fiona, for your presentation. Good to meet you. Um, I think it would be remiss not to just pass a short comment after the publication of the report yesterday because the horror of the details that we all heard uh, about the living conditions of the children and young girls in the mother and baby homes, places that are far away from anything that most of us would call a home, for many of them, hell on earth. Um, and I just hope that um, that it's taken forward in a way that um, provides disclosure and allows uh, allows this society to ensure this will never happen again. As a junior minister, I had responsibility for UNA, so I want to declare an interest in many ways for the establishment of the historical institutional abuse and for the appointment of Judge Hart. And um, I'm very aware of the victims that you talked about and conscious that of all that they had gone through. I've heard some harrowing stories of, uh, of their conditions and what they were subjected to. So can I ask you, given that we know uh, historical child abuse is extremely traumatic uh, with lifelong in impacts, and unfortunately there's a stigma attached as well, the impacts of such trauma and victims result, as you and others would know, of memory loss, blocking it out, uh, and difficulty speaking out about their experience, which leads to victims and survivors not coming forward with their experience. So Fiona, will you ensure, insofar as you can, that your staff, that they are employed within your office, are educated in trauma? or have a trauma-informed perspective when dealing with the victims of historical institutional abuse? Um, Martina, that's really insightful. Um, and I would echo all your comments, okay? Um, having led a 45-strong team of 
specialists in abuse in my last role, I'm highly aware of the need to have appropriate staff who are trauma informed. OK, so I think at the very least, when you're looking to put together a team like that, you ensure that everyone working in your organization is trauma informed from administration, perhaps through to IT. It might sound ridiculous to say, but anyone who has an opportunity in any way, shape or form to encounter a victim or survivor needs to be trauma aware. As people progress in different roles, where they're actually directly engaging with victims and survivors, perhaps around their traumatic experiences, um, then I think that's where the training becomes even more, uh, needs to be more progressive and more advanced. You know, you go from being trauma aware and trauma informed to having the appropriate qualifications that allow you to carry out that work. It would be, um, I think we're very lucky as a start off organization to be able to um, put that in place. Um, and I know, for example, my colleague who is in the personal support unit at present, she would have a background in counselling and mediation and would have um, helped, I think, over 80 victims and survivors now with their statements to the, um, the redress board. If I could also observe, and I think you made a really crucial point, that um, the reality is for a lot of victims and survivors, um, we know the victims of trauma, their memory comes and goes and that their mem they, we can have new memories resurface. And I suppose I would observe as a general point that I would hate for um, for that to be ever taken that, oh, well, what, why did someone say that in one place and didn't say it in another? The reality is um, you can have recovered memories, trauma, we know impacts on memory. And also I would offer that particularly when someone's been through a form of abuse, and I'm thinking in particular of, um, and again, forgive me for um, sexual abuse, where they may not have even had the language to describe what happened to them, and particularly male victims of sexual abuse, where they can't envisage a happening to a boy, and it, and it undermines masculinity and identity, that, um, that we need to be aware of that as a whole system. We need to have that awareness of what it means for victims to disclose their trauma and the role of memory. Uh, thank you. Um, that's really encouraging, uh, Fiona. Fiona, can I ask you how you will ensure that the victims are engaged with and that they are supported and made aware of the redress scheme? And it relates a bit to what I spoke about and something yeah. that Doug mentioned, because uh, that emotional support services, they need to know that they're available, especially as we members of the committee, um, some of us have been informed, I think probably all of us at this stage, that some victims are reporting that they have lost faith in the redress board. And they say that some of them feel that it's like being on trial. And going back to what I said earlier, where many of these victims had thought it would be a private way of telling the extent of the abuse. And for some of them, they're saying that's not their experience. And I find that a bit concerning. Um, again, Martin, you're raising really, I think, you know, important questions. I mean, my, these are general observations, OK? Um, I obviously had to look through the, his, the redress board and the commissioner's office, as you know better than I do, were set up under the historic institutional uh, Abuse Act um, 2019, and when you go through the um, the legislation for the redress board, I think even if you're familiar with legislation, you, it takes <laughs> it takes about two or three passes to even get it into your head, you know. And I mean, I'm kind of there going, how the how is a victim and survivor even meant to understand this? Yeah. Okay, so I think it is. You can't get away from the fact the redress board is a legalistic. Um, infrastructure with legal processes involved. I know that they brought on to panels um, social care specialists in order to provide that holistic knowledge and inform the process so that victims and survivors who were engaging with the panels did not feel that they were in a judicial or legalistic or adversarial um, environment, be that as it may, that was the intention. So first of all, you asked, how can we promote the redress board? Um, well, obviously, there is the public awareness campaigns that need to be undertaken, OK, and to make people aware that this is um, this is a reality, that it's there for them. You know, a lot of some of the victims and survivors have come back to me and said, well, I don't want redress. 
I don't want my experiences. I'm not looking for money. I don't want my, people to think that I'm only saying this because of money. And I suppose, um, you know, coming from a working class background myself, I relate to that, you know? And I've had to say to them, this is your right. This is a reparations framework on behalf of the state. This is your right to go for redress. You know, you're not going to be looked down on because you go for redress and reassure them that it's a right. Yeah. That's the first thing I think we need to break through that idea for victims and survivors, okay? Any perception they might have that this is, you know, people will think you're after money. The second will be obviously to carry out a good public awareness campaign, because again, it's supposed to be promote, and my office is supposed to be promoting the redress board. But I think with that promotion needs to go um, monitoring and responsibility, you know? Um, so I think the advisory panel, opening up communications, and ensuring that there's a two-way flow of communications and that you know the redress board are listening to victims and survivors is hugely important and to do it in a structured way not just a one-off way and to be fair to the redress board because i have raised the concerns with them and i have put very in quite frank language the concerns to them they are open to hearing it and they do want that dialogue i think the advisory panel of victims and survivors which is due to be set up which my office is due to set up could be a useful mechanism to explore. And actually, you know, rather than telling victims and survivors, how do you want this to happen? To get to ask victims and survivors, how what do you think is the best way to ensure that the redress board is um, victim centered and trauma informed in how it carries out its processes? And uh, finally, Chair, just one last point, um, Fiona, because it touched on what, what Doug ended with. Um, we're all aware that, unfortunately, many victims of historical institutional abuse have died. Yes. And some of them don't even have a headstone. And this relates to the memorialization because there had been discussions about a type of memorialization. And I would just encourage you, I don't think I need to, um, but just want to raise it that the engagement with the victims and survivors about the kind of memorialization is crucially important because for many of them um, a headstone uh, is so crucial on the on the graves of those that have already passed as opposed to something a statue somewhere that many of them may not see as fitting as like a headstone but i i take it from listening to you that you're acutely aware of the victims and their needs and that you will listen to them on this issue um, thank you, Martina. Um, first of all, yes, I am in terms of the issue. Do I have an instant solution? No, I don't. But I have a commitment. What I can provide is a commitment to following through on it. I think I would observe, and perhaps I'm not a very good, <laughs> probably isn't the most politically astute thing to do, but I would observe. You know, it seems a bit hypocritical for us to talk about memorials when people are struggling to find headstones for people who pass, you know? But I think that is something that goes against Doug's comment, and I'm glad you brought it up as well, that we can uh, sit down and have that conversation with victims and survivors, because I think there's two issues. One is about literally honouring people's past um, on an individual basis. And then what you discussed there or alluded to was um, the memorial process. I know victims and survivors have mixed feelings about the use of the word memorialization, but the memorial process as it flows on from an apology process, which is obviously um, on the part of the state and the institutions to undertake. And then again, to look into, um, you know, what is there, what, what do people want from memorial and what has worked? You know, I mean, the idea of living memorials, for example, um, they talked about the mother and baby homes, again, the report in the Republic of having, um, setting up, for example, scholarships to research further in this area, you know, that potentially that is a memorial. I'm not being prescriptive here, because that's not my role. But I just think there's a wide variety of potential memorials available. Fiona, I think we had a minute to the last, um, the, the last discussion at the committee. You would know that there's lots of differences around the constitutional issue. But I would tell you that uh, engaging with the members on this committee and cross-party before, this is one issue you'll find common ground. And I believe that you'll find a lot of support in this committee as you take this forward. So look forward to engaging with you again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Martina. Okay, thank you very much, Martina. Can I ask next um, from our um, to be brought in the spotlight, please? And then we'll be able to hear the question from Emma. 
So we'll get on top. Somewhat having sympathy for DJs here whenever they have those loud <laughs> of dead air whenever something doesn't happen. But we've got Emma with us now. So uh, if you want to go on ahead with your question there, please. Uh, that wee lag is incredibly frustrating. Um, Chair, thank you very much for, for letting me in. And Fiona, thanks for your presentation and for joining us this afternoon. And I mean, it's abundantly clear from everything that you've already said that, you know, the, the questions that have been asked around victim-centred process and dealing with trauma in a sensitive manner and obviously your background, you're you're well equipped to, to do that. And it's very clear from, from your contribution this far, thus far that that's your, your focus. I don't want to reiterate anything that's already been touched upon but I suppose the similarity here between um, the, the the victims of the his institutional abuse and then the, the, the victims from, from the mother and baby homes and obviously we, ha we had the statement yesterday in, in the north um, following on from, from what had happened in the, in the 26 counties a fortnight ago and I suppose my question just relates to the fact that what happened north and south and was happening we can talk about it in historical context but it, it's the very recent past was as a result of churches and other organizations basically institutionalizing a policy of misogyny and the, their their hands were held in, in doing so by by both states and society and in, in some in some uh, circumstances sort of uh, caved to that and and facilitated that and and that's so regrettable but we're in the, we're in a position now in the north where we have a change in legislation around abortion and that has not been implemented yet and and the health minister hasn't acted on that and basically i suppose the question that i have for you in terms of the human rights abuses that, that these victims have experienced and trying to break down the the barriers to having conversations around that and, and break down the stigma and we can still see laws here laws here that have been implemented but not implemented on the ground that equate to human rights abuses in 2021 um, and and just if you had any comment around that and, and how your work is, is going to tie down to breaking down that stigma. Um, Emma, that's, um, I think that's a pretty far ranging um, observation you've made and I think you've made, you know, very valuable connections and linkages there between um, attitudes and approaches north and south to victims of historic institutional childhood abuse and to victims of the mother and baby's homes. Um, I suppose just to put this into perspective, you know, when we talk like, I'm probably a bit older, we talk about <laughs> yourself, but you know, this is now the ancient history, you know? I mean, those homes were operating in the South up until the mid nineties. I have met women who've gone through those homes and had to give up their children, you know? And, and that's in my personal life. I mean, the reality is, and they said, it, and again, forgive me, it's, it's Southern media, but they said there wasn't a family untouched by this. And that's true. Everyone's got a story about um, a friend or a grand aunt, you know? So the, the hurt and the sorrow on the ground, um, the emotional part of this. I mean, 12 year olds, pregnant 12 year olds, I think, I mean, just those words, pregnant 12 year olds. I mean, that child's rights were literally just, I mean, as an individual, as, as a person, those, that child's rights were destroyed. They were smashed. I don't use a passive term, you know, these things happened. No, someone made the decision to smash that child's rights on every fundamental level. And I think that's what you're talking about here. The absolute denial and minimization in terms of victims of historic institutional childhood abuse their rights were denied as children in direct contravention of the united nations conventions of the rights of the child when it came to when it came to the mother and baby's homes you're talking about and this is not a radical feminist position this is like the minister for children in the south said this the said this institutionalized systemized misogyny the need for women to be controlled the need for girls to be controlled and, and women women and i was really glad to see the northern irish media report that you know these were children these 12 year old women giving birth to children or children themselves you know and i think 
in terms of the remit of my role and what I can comment on, I think, you know, if we don't learn from the mistakes that happened with historic institutional childhood abuse, and we don't learn from the mistakes of the mother and baby homes, we will be doomed to repeat them. Um, you know, if we, we need to understand the reality, how that system was able to operate. You know, this wasn't, this wasn't unknown. People knew what was happening. And I think, you know, anyone who looks at this and says, um, you know, again, well, it was society's fault. Well, society functions on norms. And how do norms get established? Who decides these are the norms? Because it suits someone in power. It suits the power structures that exist. And those norms are constantly being reinforced and renewed. And so that's how women and children, boys and girls, were able to be systematically and systemically abused. Um, physically abused, emotionally abused, psychologically abused, sexually abused, neglected in the context of historic institutional childhood abuse. And then the others, the abuse, the emotional, psychological abuse, the neglect, the absolute destruction of any form of agency or control that you saw in the mother and baby homes. I think that's probably within the remit of what I can comment on now in relation to your question. I know I am. Every everything has been covered, so I appreciate that and appreciate your time with us this afternoon. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank thank you very much, Emma. I'm feeling I don't have any other in, indications from any other members that are there. To, to, to speak and, and um, so therefore I can conclude on that. Uh, apologies, I do think that some of the feedback that's actually causing problems is coming from the speakers on my computer because I don't have headphones um, in at the minute but I'll get that rectified for next week for people. But can I take an opportunity Fiona to thank you for your presentation. I thank you for coming along to us. Um, it is to that the committee has um, had a keen interest in from we got together as a committee about a year ago um, and, and and the fact that you're you're here and that the, the movement of a, a full fledged commissioner can move forward and um, which will deliver results on the ground and, and services for um the people who are survivors. I think that, that gives us some comfort and knowing that that's there and that if we have issues that we can come to you uh, and likewise that there are issues that need to be championed that you come back to us as well. I think that that's just it allows and the landscape to, to change uh, and for survivors to know that there are people there for them on, on, on all fronts. So can I wish you well uh, in your work in the period ahead? I hope that staff team in place uh, and that you will have the support that you need to be able to do uh, the time you have ahead. And just on behalf of the community to wish you all the best in that and thank you for coming along today. Thank you. I really appreciated the opportunity. Okay, members, I'm just going to take a moment to allow um, the communication team to let everybody come back up into the spotlight again for a moment. Um, so that is everybody that is there. Okay, um, ju just to highlight, we'll, I'll take an opportunity now um, to reflect on both sessions. Maybe just explain to members there's a difficulty because of the communication that we can't take an extra round of people contributing or asking to propose things until we're in this format because if somebody proposes then other members can come in and could but whenever you're in an audience it would make pulling each person back up and down again and it would it would be very uh, difficult but what we'll try and do is after each presentation get into this format uh, of the committee to be able to see if there's a and further that people want it to action. Um, so look, maybe if we go with the presentation that we've just had there uh, on the um, from Fiona, is there any comments that members want to make or anything that people would like to propose on the back of that? I think, Martina, are you, you looking at it there? Chair, well, uh, I, I want in on the previous one as well, but just on this, this particular one, um, I think that listening to Fiona and the questions that were put to her and the discussions that we've had in this committee, for someone who's only in brief in, in situ a few weeks, um, she's very across the brief. 
She's obviously coming with that degree of expertise and she instilled confidence in me as to how she was going to handle this. And I think we just need to be mindful of obviously giving her the space, but I would like update it uh, without pulling her away from the work that she's doing um, in so far and, and as far as we can as possible, you know, without without disturbing her too much because she has a very tight time frame. Okay, I think maybe Martina, if you would agree, she did mention her priorities going forward and sort of said that between now and the end of March, she hoped to have her staff team in place. That maybe if we look at that first session of our committee just after Easter, that she maybe will have concluded recruiting the staff and, and we'll have people all come up and working and then that a bit of um, space to come back and update us then on the other. So would that be maybe if we aim sort of April time for that? Okay. Another issue, it was an issue that I had mentioned through there about maybe her ability to be able to provide support services for um, the baby um, survivors, something in that front. Would, I would maybe want to write to the executive office just to ask about Bedroom support services for those from the mother and, and baby survivors because uh, I know that the, the First Minister did give that commitment yesterday and somewhat um, Fiona has said that there may be things that they could do, maybe they aren't the dedicated place for it, but um, I just think that maybe if we could put that little bit of um, pressure on just for, for um, between now and the end of the year that if somebody does, is highlighted there may be some mechanism for that. So could we seek some clarity just on the mechanisms that are there? Would that be agreeable? Okay. Um, if there is nobody... Yes, Emma, are you like, yes, go no, ahead. I was just going to say, um, obviously that report, I know that it's like a joint um, departmental or it's just across departments. Does the, does the call to health or to or do we know? Do we know? I can, if we're writing to TO, maybe just with a word to the fact that they might have to consult with other departments. Yeah. It makes sense for time. I think that's a really um, important question, Emma, because I was kind of thinking that it was something that was health oriented as well, uh, but yet the presentation was done by the executive office. But I think as we submit the question and the letter, and it's not the response of TEO, they will pass it then to health and then it comes back to us it'll have done that loop so hopefully we'll, we'll find out but it would be important to find out just which committee is going to deal with that in terms of scrutiny going forward okay uh, thank you for that members then if we go to the first presentation that we had then in terms of the uh, from the junior ministers and maybe just looking at some of the outworkings of that Martina do you want to put the stage in that and then Emma um, are there are three possible follow-ups that I would like the committee to consider. One is, could we reach out to IBEC and the CBA and ask them to brief us on their experience of how they're finding since the end of the transition, uh, just to we get a wider uh, scope? I don't know about the rest of you, maybe in other committees, but I know I certainly have got a handle on what's happening with haulage and, and trade, but I think it might be good to widen that out just to have us informed. The second to pick up with you, Chair, if you could go back to reschedule the Good Friday Agreement Committee, if you can recall, we were to have it and then there were technical problems and then there was clashes and we didn't do that, but maybe that's on your agenda. And then the third is the proposal. Sometimes I work well with the vigil in front of me, and I think given there's a number of committees and listening to the members in other scrutiny committees that I'm on, they wouldn't be as, I think, familiar as we are. But I know even on this committee, I would find it helpful to have like an organizational chart. Maybe Shauna McGee or McGigan might consider doing this for us. Of you have the joint committee, the specialist committee. I think is it this executive subcommittee still, if it's that's the right name as you called it today, that's, that's in place. Under that, we have an um, a interdepartmental working group. We have then the, the number of committees and the kind of the common frameworks that fall under each of our responsibility. I think if we had something like an organizational chart 
a chart like that, it would help us, but it also would help all the other committees then knowing when to exchange information with us, vice versa. And I'm just making that proposal. It's something that Shauna would probably be able to put together even in her head better than I'm describing it here. Yeah. And so I know that Shauna is listening in on this committee because I know that's something that she also, I would suspect she's getting her crayons ten out at this stage and will definitely have something for her. So that's a number of reasons to keep it as simple as possible for me to understand all of the various different um, fears that there are in different communities and how to connect with each other to try and work out where fundamentally groups on the ground can actually feed in the committees and then uh, move from that. So that would be very useful, but we'll, we'll get to Shauna on, on that one. Emma? Chair, it's been, Martina has covered it there. I was just going to suggest the inviting of, of some of those, the business organisations. So if we, if we can get a presentation from the people that are working on the ground on these issues. Okay, perfect. That's grand. Okay, so we've got that. Right, folks, then I think if that's us finished up with the two presentations, I can move forward. There's not a huge amount left to be pleased to hear. So um, we will move on then to item number seven. This is the Forward Work Programme, uh, which is available on page uh, 182. Maybe just remember, we did discuss last week about the invite come from the, the Shan Special committee a special select committee to withdraw the from you um, and that this may need to take place on a different day so i think we have a proposal for 10 o'clock on tuesday morning um, and we're going to confirm that with them uh, because they have moved up of their committee meetings to tuesday uh, and we say that if we can get it at 10 o'clock hopefully that will come for us, uh, what's happening in the, the assembly chamber starts at 10 30 for us or uh, if there's a matter of the day or petitions or stuff, that might push back to about 10, 40 or to 50. So it might enable enough of us to be able to get to that. But we'll confirm that with members um, at maybe sort of Thursday, Friday of this week. But that's sort of where we're penciling in at the moment. Um, just to let members know, we are content to ask members if you are content to receive a written briefing instead of an oral briefing officials on the funding arrangements for the dedicated mechanism for Article 2. Um, maybe just on that one, I'll take my, just to update members, we get quite a number of requests from the department to provide written uh, updates rather than oral updates. And I just have to say, for one, I'm not normally a fan of that because I think that sometimes whenever you read a written briefing, it frequently doesn't tell you very much. Uh, and if we can get the actual oral briefing, it means that we normally get a written briefing that comes in front of that. We can form the sort of probing questions that we're expected to do as a committee. And whenever we give the presentation, then we can probe a little deeper, which I do think is our role as a scrutiny um, my, my, I take members' guidances, but I think it might be advisable that unless you absolutely um, extenuate and uh, reason, I think that if we request it as a committee, an oral, I think that's what we should get. Would members be in agreement with that? Okay, yeah. So we can send that, that message back then. Um, going to request an oral briefing then from the assembly research on the pro we're going to prepare ourselves for the update that we will get from the department once the consultation completes we have, we're going to check whether we can get that presentation for the program government this side of easter or meeting the other side of easter it just depends on the presentation closes and it'll have information but we will schedule a briefing from the research department before uh, to give us a resume of the program for government that's various outputs and we'll measure that against the presentation that we get from uh, the department. So that will be something that we're in the forward work program. Remember content to note the rest of the forward work program or are there any questions? I think we're happy to note them. Then members, if we move to item eight correspondence and there's 10 items of correspondence 
187 to 231 in the meeting pack. Just one that I want to highlight. Item 8.1 is a response from the Equality Commission in relation to disability action plans. If you remember back at our meeting on 9 September, uh, we asked for a response from the Equality Commission providing information on public authorities who do not currently have a disability action plan. So the, the committee agreed to request an update on the session the 31st of December and contained in there. Does any member want to comment on that? Okay, so that's there for four members. Um, there's information from the Committee of Finance on the um, requesting that we as Committee of Executive Office review the draft budget in respect to the Executive Office and report comes back to the Committee uh, by the 12th of February. Can I just confirm, Michael, have we requested information about the size of the budget budgeting has increased quite significantly for the executive office, but we don't seem to have any information as to why, and there's probably a very legitimate reason for it, but did we agree last week to write ask for information on that? Yes, Chair, we, we, we wrote to the department to ask for, for details of the departmental budget in the, in the light of the, of, of, the, um, of the general budget. Yeah. Okay. So... Should we maybe uh, schedule an oral briefing then from officials on the spending plan for the 21-22 budget? I think that would be fairly normal to get that oral briefing on the budget. Doug, are you looking in there? No. Oh, I want to. Okay. Um, right, I think that's it in terms of all the correspondence. Um, the if we can move on into item nine, any other business? Is there any other business from members? Okay, well then look, the date and time of the next meeting will be in this part next week again. Hopefully we'll have polished up and I'll have a set of headphones by then. Uh, and also just that we will come back Thursday or Friday in terms of whether we have that meeting with um, the select committee on uh, maybe Tuesday morning of next week, but we'll confirm that in the next 48 hours. Members, if I could thank you all for your attendance at the meeting with Starleaf, and we will all enjoy our long commute home today, So, especially for Martina. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.